What's up all my YouTube people? It's Drika and we are back for another video. This one is for P Valley season two, episode six, titled Savage. Another very good episode, another episode dealing with real life topics. This one was also heavy. So this episode opens up with Diamond and Big Mom. They're at his place. They're smashing. He can't really look at her because every time he looks at her face, he sees Keyshawn. So he has to turn her over and smash from the back. She then asks him why he keeps letting off in the condom. She says that she wants it in her mouth. I said, okay, big bone girl, we see you did not hold back at all. And Diamond says any smart man knows that he needs to dispose of his seed. Okay, so after they're finished, Big Bone gets up to get some water. She then sees Montavious ring. So I think this might be them foreshadowing, letting us know that Big Bone might be there to find out some information for the Delta Devoted gang about what happened to Montavious. Or maybe she possibly could have had some direct ties to Montavious. We don't know yet. So she goes to touch the ring. Diamond tells her not to touch it. She asks him what is it for and he tells her that he has it there for protection. Then she asks him why doesn't he do security for the pink anymore. She says you must have tried to save a hoe who didn't want to be saved. And he says well who told you that? She said your eyes. And she brought up how every time they have sex he always closes his eyes and he doesn't want to look at her. And she tells him next time she needs his eyes wide open and on her. Little Murder and Big T are out and they are hanging out with their gang, the Huntsville Hustlers. Little Murder pulls up with a car that he gifts to Big T. As soon as Big T gets in the car, he breaks down and starts crying because he is just so surprised and so shocked that they did that for him. While Haley is at the club taking a shower, Big L turns the water off on her. So she runs out the shower, shouting and screaming, what's going on? I paid the water bill. He said, yeah, but you didn't pay me. So she tells him to cut the water back on because she has somewhere to be. Uncle Clifford and Big L are back in Uncle Clifford's office and they are talking about Haley. They are saying how she does not have any blood on her hands, but the rest of them do. And that she has a lot of nerve after everything that they've done for her that she wants to put the pink back on the auction block. Then Big L tells Uncle Clifford that the Ugandans will sell them the AC systems that they need to reopen the club for 5k. And Clifford says that she might have to get online and start showing feet to make some money. Big L then shows Uncle Clifford a flyer that has been posted on Instagram of roulette and whisper so they will be stripping at a spades tournament but they are using the pink and the pea valley name saying that they're going to bring the pink to the people big l then mentions that duffy is back and he has a load on his truck of merchandise but uncle clifford does not want to get involved with that she then says that they should turn Haley into the police, but Big L reminds her that Haley is not the one who pulled the trigger or buried the body. Teak and Little Murder are at the barber shop. Big Teak is getting a haircut, and the barber is using a technique where he uses fire to shape the hair. That was interesting. That was my first time seeing that. But anyway, the barber asks him what is he going to do now that he's out. Little Murder says that he's going to go back on the road with him and be his security as soon as they're able to go back on tour. When the barber is finished cutting Big Teak's hair, he turns him around to look in the mirror. So when he turns him around, he says that Teak is looking casket sharp. And we see that the barber has a photo on the mirror of the blues singer Robert Johnson, who was titled the Godfather of Blues. So the rumor and the myth around Robert Johnson is that he sold his soul to the devil for his talent, for money and for fame. So this is the first foreshadowing that we have of death in this episode. Little Murder steps outside to talk on the phone because Keyshawn has called him. So they're on the phone talking and she told him that Rome tried to force himself on her. He then says that he's happy that he's dead then. And then she tells him that she told Wody that Rome knew about him. So he says, knew what? What are you talking about? She couldn't exactly tell him what it was because then Psycho Derek walks in and he asks her who she's on the phone with. 
She told him that it was a little murder and he was asking about Rome's funeral. And then Derek says that he was such a good guy and he got Keyshawn a bunch of deals. No, actually, he was not a good guy. He was a controlling psycho, just like you, Derek. So Derek tells Keyshawn that his friend has some leads on a job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been hearing this since season one. He can't never get no damn job. He can't never get no income. I cannot stand men like him that live off of women. Trash. Bum. So anyway, he says that he's going to his friend's house to help him set up a fire pit. And he asks Keyshawn if she wants to come. She says no. Why in the hell would Kishan want to go anywhere with you? You literally just beat this woman and put an iron to her face and you beat on her child. She don't want to go nowhere with you. Big Teak is finished getting his haircut. He comes out of the barbershop and he has on a sweater that has a photo of the King of Hearts, which is a king who is holding a sword through his head. Another foreshadowing of death. Mercedes goes over to Shell and Terika's house to bring them some groceries. Shell comes opening the door looking like she has not touched soap and water in about a week, maybe even two. She looks horrible and you can tell she just been in the house drinking. So when Mercedes goes in the house, she opens up the fridge. There is basically nothing in the refrigerator and there are two oranges in there that are covered in mold. So Mercedes takes them out to throw them in the trash and she sees that the trash can is literally full of wine bottles. Mercedes says, well, maybe we can get you some help. And then Shell says that she does not have a problem. Talk about somebody who is in denial. She says that the only thing she needs is a job. Mercedes tells her that she is worried about her and she tells her that she called Terika a mistake. Shell said that she would never say that. She doesn't remember saying it because she was drunk. Mercedes offers to take Terika off of her hands for a while until she gets back on her feet. Shell says no, there is a difference between being a mother and being a parent. And she tells Mercedes that you may have pushed her out of your body, but I raised her. So Mercedes gets upset and she says, well, nothing I do will ever be enough for you. And then she leaves. While she's walking out to her car, she gets a call from coach. And he says that he wants her to come back to finish the Mercedes experience. And he says that his wife can't stop talking about her. Little Murder and Big Teak are at a chicken spot getting something to eat. The waitress is gushing over Teak over his light eyes and his light skin and murder is like can you get us some water and why you had it can you get one for yourself and he calls her thirsty while she walks off murder makes mention of the bill and big t said don't worry about the bill i got this so then murder says oh so this is a date t said that he never thought that they would get a chance to have a date outside of jail he brings up a time when they were in jail um one of the guards pushed him in a closet and he thought that the guard was pushing him in there so he could take advantage of him. But inside the closet, it was little murder and he had pasta and candlelight and they had like a little date in jail. And he says, well, that was then, but you've moved on as you should have. And it seems like the whole world has moved on. And then he asks little murder about Uncle Clifford. He says, well, what is he like? And then Little Murder says, she. So Big T thinks that he's talking about a woman. And Little Murder explains to him that Uncle Clifford likes to be called she. Then he says that Uncle Clifford is like eating funnel cake once a year at the fair. And that is like an eclipse. And you can just see the heartbreak on T's face while Murder is talking to him about Uncle Clifford. Murder tells him that he messed up his situation with Uncle Cliff and Teek says that he has a habit of messing things up. And then he says again that he messed up to Teek basically saying that he messed things up the way that he handled Big Teek. He puts his hands on top of Teek's hand, Teek removes his hand and then he pinches Little Murder nose and he tells him that he is forgiven. We then go back to Keyshawn. Derek has left the house and she has decided that she is finally about to make a run for it. She decided that she has finally had enough of his abuse. So we see her go to a vent and she grabs the pink gun that she got from Haley. This is where she has been hiding it. And then she grabs a bag and she grabs her kids. 
But before leaving, she takes her cell phone out of her bag and she puts it down on the table because, you know, Derek literally tracks her every move and everything she does from her phone because he has her phone attached to his phone, like the psycho that he is, controlling asshole. I cannot stand him. So her and her babies go outside. They go to the car. She puts them in the car. She tries to start the car. The car will not start. So she gets out to see what is going on. And she sees that he has done something to the wires in her car. I think he may have removed a battery or something like that. I'm not exactly sure. But he has done something to her car that will prevent the car from starting. So she just has this look of once again being defeated and being helpless and being stuck in this situation all over her face and she feels like there's nothing she can do so she takes her kids and she goes back inside and it was just so sad oh my goodness you guys it was so sad I felt so bad for her and the kids I mean when are we going to get rid of him like he gotta go bro because at this point I mean if you stopping somebody from being able to use their car that's literally he is keeping her and these kids there against her will the only way that Keyshawn and her kids will ever really be free from him and his abuse is if he dies. That says she cannot just leave and that be it because he will always look for her and them kids. Like she can never be free. The only way that she and her kids will be free is if he dies. He has to go. So Little Murder and Big Teak are at the gas station. They're getting gas for Teak's new car. Then Murder overhears his voice on the radio coming from another person's car at the gas station. So he goes over to their car and he turns up the radio and he's like, that's me, that's me. So it's him with Tina Snow, a.k.a. Meg the Stallion. And it's from the verse that he sent to DJ Never Scare. So he gets hype. He's super excited. He gets on the car. He starts rapping. And then a guy in the car behind him hunks, the car, hunks his horn. And he's like, are y'all finished with the pump? And you know T, he just go off. He's like, who the fuck you talking to? <laughs> and Murder is like, you know what? I should let him get you, but it's cool. So then we go to the spades tournament where Whisper and Roulette are dancing at. And then we see the guy from the private room that Roulette went down on. He approaches her and he asks her to hook him up with Whisper. And Roulette tells him, I don't think she get down like that. And he was like, well, tell her I'll give her two sacks just to let me go down on her. And Roulette says, damn, I wish I had that option instead of getting on my knees. So... They're showing us again how, you know, in the black community and a lot of black men, they'll like go out of their way and do extra stuff for women of a different ethnicity and who are of a lighter skin complexion because Roulette did not have that option. The only thing he wanted her to do was get down on her knees and give him fellatio. Now, I hope that Roulette does not set Whisper up and send her into a situation blindly where she can end up really getting hurt. So back at the condo, we see Mercedes, the coach, and the wife, Farrah. The two of the ladies are sitting on the couch. Farrah is telling Mercedes that she couldn't stop thinking about her since the last time they were together. And she has her hand on her leg. Mercedes is telling her to chill. She doesn't want the coach to get mad because she doesn't want to mess up the money situation that she has going on. So the coach is in the kitchen while all this is going on. He can't hear nothing that they're saying because he got the blender on. He's making some type of drink to help him get an erection because he can't do it naturally. And the wife is like, oh, girl, that's not nothing but Viagra and sea moss. So they go into the bedroom and start smashing. And then Farrah puts her fingers up Mercedes but JJ, And you can see that is what really is getting Mercedes off, not the coach. So he stops and he gets off the bed. He backs up and he looks at the two of them like, okay, what the hell is going on here? He accuses Mercedes of turning his wife out, but little does he know his wife has been like in J long before Mercedes came into the picture. He says, we've been married for 19 years and you ain't never like women. And she says, oh, uh, well, actually I have. For the whole 19 years, I've been like in J. I actually like it just as much as you do. She says that he doesn't know a lot about her because he's been busy feeling his own dreams, desires, and his fantasies. And she says, what about me? What about what I want? What about my dreams? And then Mercedes chimes in and she says, yeah, what about her dreams? And I was like, Mercedes, you might want to sit this one out and be quiet, girl. You are trying to secure your bag. Just let Farrah deal with this. 
So then the coach grabs Mercedes and he puts her out of the condo. He says, I brought you in my home and you betrayed me. You were supposed to be for me. He called her a backwoods hoe and told her that her sponsorship has expired. Mercedes told him that he still owed her her 40K for the night. He tried to put her out without giving her her money and then Farrah intervened and said, no, that's not right. You don't do that. You don't break a deal. So when he goes to get the money to give to Mercedes, Farrah gives her her shoes and she just looks at her like, I'm sorry. And Mercedes is so hurt that she just grabs her shoes and leaves without the money. Now, Mercedes, you should have knew that woman wasn't going to really stick up for you like that. She wasn't going to leave that life and she wasn't going to leave that money. And you definitely should not have left without getting your money first. This was so typical. Guys always love having threesomes in their relationships and their marriages until their wife and the other woman start to like each other more than they like him and want to exclude him from the activities. Then all of a sudden he is against it and doesn't want to do it anymore. So then we get to the masquerade ball. Andre is up at the mic. He is giving his speech about how he wants to run for mayor of Chuckalisa and how he still plans on bringing the casino to Chuckalisa and how he wants to basically just bring jobs and wealth and prosperity to the town. He gets about two, maybe three hand claps from the crowd. It looks like he is the only black person in the room. So then Andre and Corbin see that Haley is there in the room because she asks Andre a question. She asks him what makes him think that prosperity for all is possible. So he says that because he was a black boy that was born to a drug addicted mother and whose father died when he was only seven and he should have been a statistic. But Merritt Tidell saw the potential in him and he nourished it and he guided him and he paid for him to go on to Morehouse College. And he intends to give the same care to all of the sons and daughters of Chuckalisa. And then everybody in the room starts clapping because, you know, white people, they just love to hear black people talk about how they grew up struggling and pain and trauma. They just love a black trauma story. So Cordell walks over and he is pissed off that Haley is there. He asks Andre if he invited her there. He says no. So Andre himself doesn't look too happy that she is there. He told her that that was not the time or the place for her games. So then we see Duffy going to talk to Roulette outside while she is smoking a cigarette. He basically lets her know that he likes her. And she says, well, yeah, I like you too, but I'm a hoe though. <laughs> and he's like, well, isn't that a coincidence? Because I'm a hoe too. And then they end up kissing. Back at Keyshawn's house, Derek arrives back at home. She can hear him pulling up. So she is sitting on the couch and she is holding the gun towards the door. But unfortunately, she decides not to do it. As soon as she hears his key turning the lock, she hides the gun under a pillow on the couch. So he sits down next to her and he says, your phone says you haven't moved all day. Yeah, of course she hasn't moved all day. You have done something to her car. She can't go anywhere, you psycho. So then we see Little Murder and Waldy. They are on the phone. Wody tells Little Murder that Teak cannot come back on the road with him. He basically says that he is too wild and that he is a liability. Little Murder doesn't want to do that to him, so he says that he'll talk to him. And then Wody mentions Rome OD, and then Murder says, well, it's mighty funny that you know that he OD'd. And Wody says, yeah, well, I'm good at handling stuff. So in the middle of their conversation, Little Murder phones die. So he goes to look in the glove compartment of the car to see if there is a charger in there. And he sees that Big Teak has a gun in the glove compartment. Teak goes into this house that looks like a trap house. There are people in there. They are high off drugs and there are children in the living room watching TV. Horrible. This is so horrible because stuff like this happens in real life. And these kids be in these house with these adults who are in there high out of their mind, out of drugs. So while Tick is in this house, he is walking in a room towards this closet. And while he is walking, we just hear him having flashbacks in his head of this woman. She's screaming at children. And then we hear the children and they are screaming and they are crying. He opens the closet and then he sees this little boy in there and his shoulder is covered with blood. So... We then learn later on in this episode that his mom had like a mental breakdown and she went crazy and she stabbed his three siblings to death. He is the only one that survived because he ran and hid in that closet. 
So Little Murder goes into the room and he basically snaps Teak out of his flashbacks. And he says, why would you go into this house without your gun? And then he tells him, this isn't just a trap house. This used to be my house when I was a kid. Murder says, yeah, it used to be. So he basically is telling Teak that you have to learn how to leave the past in the past and learn how to move forward. Back at the masquerade event after Corbin kicked Haley out, she didn't leave. She waited outside on the steps for a lady named Georgie to come, who we find out is an executive, and she is over Promised Land. She basically runs everything and calls all the shots. Haley tells her that she is the owner of the pink, and she tells her that she has not sold the pink because she was not being offered the amount of money that she feels she was deserving of. And she told her that she was asking for $10 million. Now, Georgie did not say that she would give her $10 million for the pink, but she did say that she would give her a lot more than what she was being initially offered and that she would talk to her soon. And then Corbin asks her, well, what about Andre's endorsement for mayor? She says that she really does not care who the mayor of Chukalisa is as long as they do not get in the way of her getting her casino. Back at Uncle Clifford's house, Cliff and Grandma Ernestine are sitting in the kitchen and she is sweating profusely and coughing. Initially, they think that it might possibly be her diabetes, but Clifford checks her diabetes and her sugar is fine. So then Clifford checks her temperature and she has a fever of 102. So Clifford calls Toy to see how she is doing and she answers the phone. She sounds horrible. She is coughing and Clifford says, I knew that you did not just have allergies. So she has given COVID to Ernestine. So you guys, Ernestine might be out of here this season. So back at Andre's house, Haley somehow has gotten into his house and she is sitting in the dark waiting for him to get home. He enters the house and does not notice her sitting in the living room. So he doesn't know that she is there until she says something to him and scares the hell out of him. So he is on the phone talking with Corbin. He gets off the phone with Corbin. He is pretty pissed off with Haley and he is over her antics. So he tells her that she needs to leave. And he also told her that the only reason she won the auction for the pink is because he let her win. So then Haley starts to seduce him with her womanly wiles. And she says, yeah, you got the power, Andre. So what are you going to do with it? She says, you're in charge, sir. Tell me what to do. So he tells her to take off her dress and crawl to him, which she does. And then Finally, they smash. Thank God that storyline is over. I was tired of them dragging on the sexual tension between the two of them. So thank goodness we do not have to deal with that anymore. We get back to Little Murder and Big Teak. They're out by the water. They are talking, having very deep conversation. Murder apologizes to Teak for him being sent to the hole because he felt like it was his fault because Teak got into the fight that he was in. That is what caused him to go to the hole. And Murder said that he hasn't been the same since he was sent to the hole. Teak told him that was not his first time being sent to the hole while he was in prison. He told Murder that when he saw that guy standing over him with that knife, he saw his mother. So his mother stabbed his sister in the neck, his five-year-old brother in the chest, and his eight-month-old sister in the head. He said that he ran as hard as his seven-year-old feet could take him into the closet and he stayed there listening to his brothers and his sisters screaming until they all went silent. He said that the devil was in his mom. Now the devil is in him and he felt like his story should have ended in that house with his siblings. And then he said that people thought the three tears that he had on his face were for people that he killed, but those three tears were actually for his three siblings. Murder told him that the devil was back at the house locked in the closet and that his story was just beginning and that they were finna go back out on tour tomorrow. So then Teek says, you can have tomorrow, I'm gonna have tonight. And he asked Murder where he wanted him to drop him off to. And then I knew what was going to happen. I knew what Teek was planning to do to himself. So Murder told him that he was going to stay with him. He could tell that he was going through something. And he said, no, I'm not going. I know that you're in a bad space right now. And I don't want you letting your thoughts get the best of you. 
So Tiki's still asking him, where do you want me to drop you off at? Murder says, I'm not leaving you. So then Teak gets upset and he tells him to get the F out of the car. And Murder said, you're going to have to drag me out of the car. Then he pulls the gun out of the glove compartment and he puts it to his head. So he says that tonight I'm going from the dark to the light. And then he starts crying and he's like, I'm so tired. And Little Murder is pleading with him. He's like, man, give me the gun. He tells Teak that they have money to get, they have houses to buy, and they have dreams to build. Teak tells him that there's no more light for him. He can't see the light. And Little Murder says, I see the light for you. Teak said, all my light is gone. And then Little Murder says, I'm right here. I'm not going nowhere. And Teak says, Huntsville Hustlers for life. And then Little Murder says, yeah, for life. And then he pulls the trigger. And that was the end of Teak, you guys. That scene was so heavy, but at the same time, it was amazing. Jay Alfonso and John Clarence Stewart, their acting was top tier. This scene was, man, it was just so believable. I was like, wow. After learning a little bit about Teek's backstory and what happened to him as a child and his siblings, it makes all the sense why he behaved the way that he behaved, why he was so emotional and would just go off on people at the drop of a dime. He was just dealing with so much trauma, so much pain, carrying so much baggage and so much darkness. And, you know, unfortunately, he made his mind up what he wanted to do. And when people are in that space, when they make that final decision, they can have multiple people around them trying to save them. But sometimes it just doesn't work when their mind is made up. I hated to see Teak go out like that, but these are real life situations. People struggle with these thoughts every day. So then we see Murder get out of the car. He is, of course, distraught. He can't believe what he just witnessed, and he has Teak's blood all over his clothes. So now Murder has this pain and trauma and this baggage that he will have to carry around with him, and more than likely this will change him because a person doesn't witness something like that and then bounce right back to being their normal self. So we'll see in the rest of the episodes how this situation affects Little Murder. In the next scene, we're at Mercedes' house. She is sitting at her dining room table having a drink and then she hears a knock at her door. It's Terika. She's standing at her door crying. Mercedes asks her what's wrong. She pulls out a positive pregnancy test and gives it to Mercedes. Mercedes thought that by her being over there in the house with Shell, that that would afford her a different life from the one that she had. But we see that this is a cycle that is continuing and Mercedes hasn't even been raising her. So Shell thought that she, you know, was Miss Perfect and was giving Terika this perfect life. But unfortunately, she still ended up pregnant. Okay, you guys, so in the last scene of this episode, we see Little Murder. He goes to Uncle Cliff's house. He is banging on the door, and Grandma Ernestine comes open to the door, and she says, Daddy, is that you? So, if you know anything about elderly people, when they are nearing death, they start seeing their people, like their parents, their grandparents, people, you know, that would have been alive when they were much younger. So I think that this possibly is another foreshadowing of death for Grandma Ernestine. So then Uncle Clifford comes outside. She sees Little Murder. She sees that he is crying and covered in blood. Little Murder says, I'm not okay. I'm not okay. And then he falls into Uncle Clifford's arms and Uncle Clifford takes him inside the house. So that was the end of this episode, you guys. Another very good episode from P Valley. So from what I have been hearing, they will be taking a break this week. After this episode, some people might need a break. So the new episode is supposed to be airing on the 23rd, but you guys know how stars do. Sometimes they will leak an episode or they will put it up for like an hour or two and then take it down. So we'll see. You guys make sure to like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all in the next video. Everybody take care. Bye. This one, bye.